the Triathlon Show 355. Everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Dr. Callum Brownstein. Callum is a lecturer in exercise physiology at Newcastle University, a role that he's uh, actually just taking up uh, in the well, or has taken up by the time you listen to this in the in the last couple of weeks or so. He has conducted extensive research in fatigability and the mechanisms of neuromuscular fatigue in endurance exercise and also in some other contexts. But uh, for this interview, we, of course, focus on the endurance sports context and the mechanisms and applications of neuromuscular fatigue. But before we get into this episode, a big thanks to our sponsors, Roka. Roka produces exceptional quality triathlon wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, performance sunglasses, and prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses. If you want to go faster in the water, then look to Roka's range of wetsuits. From the entry level to the top of the line wetsuits, all of them come with arm slap technology and exceptional quality and comfort in the water. Roka's tri suits work perfectly together with the wetsuits as they too come with arm slap technology to really maximize your shoulder mobility for the swim. And on the bike and run, they are optimized for aerodynamics and comfort. Roka's range of sunglasses and prescription glasses is also packed with innovation with patented technologies such as the Geeko anti slip technology. They are ultralight and they have excellent optical properties. Visit roca.com forward slash TTS for 20% off your order. And thank you to Zenate. The Zenate Indoor Swim Trainer is a one-of-a-kind swim bench that helps you improve your technique through an early catch, maximize propulsion through a more powerful stroke, and stay consistent by doing swim workouts at home even when you can't go to the pool. It is available in the UK, EU, and the US, with free shipping in both the UK and the US. It is very affordable, similar to a pair of running shoes, and best of all, the investment is risk-free. If you're not in love with the Zenate Swim Trainer after two weeks of using it and using their free program, you can send it back and get a full refund. Learn more and get a 20% discount on your swim trainer on zenateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Now without any further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Callum Brownstein. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Callum. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, can we start by just a, an introduction? So please tell us who you are and uh, what your academic and sporting background is. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Callum Brownstein. Uh, technically, I am still a postdoctoral researcher at University Jean Monnet in Saint Etienne, France, um, where for the last three and a half years I've been working under the supervision of uh, Professor Guillaume Mie. I have now left France um, because uh, I will take up a job as a lecturer in exercise physiology at Newcastle University um, in the northeast of England, where I'll start next month. Um, Prior to my uh, postdoc, I was also in Newcastle where I did my PhD at Northumbria University. So that's the other university in Newcastle. Um, my research interests are on acute exercise responses. So what goes on in the body during exercise uh, with a particular focus on neuromuscular fatigability. So the transient impairments in muscle function that we see with exercise. Um, but I'm interested in this from a sort of integrative perspective. Um, one of the things I find interesting about studying neuromuscular fatigability is that, in a sense, it's the, the manifestation of everything that's occurring um, within and upstream of the muscle. So it can be influenced by uh, factors intrinsic to the muscle, as well as the cardiovascular system's ability to transport oxygen to the muscle, which can be influenced by many things. So it can be influenced by uh, environmental conditions, the character characteristics of the exercise that we perform, uh, or the population in question. So it makes for quite a, an interesting and diverse area of research. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I've, I've had I've read some of your uh, research and uh, just briefly browsed other parts of it. And and there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff you can do in that area. But I think for mm. for the for the listeners, we should start by some clarifications and definitions. So so maybe we start by just defining fatigue and and specifically maybe in in this context uh, neuromuscular fatigue as well. 
Yeah, so it's it's a logical question to start with defining fatigue. It's also a question that if you were to ask 10 researchers who study fatigue how they would define fatigue, you might get a number of different answers. And that's because fatigue is studied in many different contexts. So it's not just studied in terms of endurance sports. Um, but within the sport and exercise sciences, fatigue was classically defined as an inability to maintain the required speed or power output. Um, so, for example, if you look at literature from 30, 40 years ago, uh, you'll see sentences like participant exercise to fatigue. Um, we would now term this task failure because it was recognized that muscle function is impaired well before task failure occurs. So, for example, if you perform uh, severe intensity exercise or actually even moderate intensity exercise, your, your maximum muscle capacity is actually reduced very quickly. But that doesn't mean you can't sustain the task. Uh, so then fatigue was defined as a, a reduction in maximal muscle performance, so a reduction in the maximal force and or power, power generating capacity of the muscle. And that's what I'm especially interested in, is uh, changes in, in muscle function and the neuromuscular mechanisms which contribute to those. Um, but more recently, there's been a... Uh, an effort to use a more unified definition of fatigue which doesn't depend on the context in which it's studied. So I would define fatigue um, in the context of endurance sports the same way I would define it in, for example, a clinical context. And that's as a sensation of tiredness or weakness or lethargy, um, which exercises a potent stimulus for that. And the impairments in neuromuscular function that we see are uh, are also an important can be an important contributing factor towards that sensation of fatigue. Mm. Isn't there a possibility that you might, uh, especially if you, let's say, exercise in the uh, in the heavy domain, that you might not feel that fatigue, but you might still have an impairment in your maximum capacity to generate force? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, these things aren't. Yeah, I think that within the heavy domain, you may see. I mean, generally quite early during exercise, you will see increases in the perception of fatigue. They may sort of stabilize quite early, but relative to baseline, you'll often see an increase in fatigue concurrent with uh, uh, an impairment in the capacity of the muscle to produce force. But they are not always necessarily very tightly linked. I think it depends on the sort of intensity and the characteristics of the exercise that we're performing in terms of the link between those uh, those two th- the, the neuromuscular fatigability and the perception of fatigue yeah so uh, regarding the different types of fatigue so so we talked about neuromuscular fatigue and that can be broken down further into into components so can you uh, can can you do that for us break break down the components on neuromuscular fatigues and also are there any other uh, fatigue components other than neuromuscular that we should be aware of when it comes to uh, endurance exercise? Yeah, so I can understand uh, sort of where the question comes from. So again, I would say that there is only one one fatigue, and that is a sensation. And then there are various factors which can contribute to that. Um, so I think the question probably comes from if you look at the neuromuscular lit- the literature on neuromuscular fatigability during exercise, you will see terms like. Um, muscle fatigue, neuromuscular fatigue, central fatigue, peripheral fatigue, supraspinal fatigue, all these different apparent types of fatigue. Um, What they really refer to is transient impairments in function occurring as a result of exercise at various steps along the neuromuscular pathway. So if we sort of unpackage the, the main ones there, we have what is termed neuromuscular fatigue. This refers generally refers to a reduction in the maximal force generating capacity of the muscle, which we measure during generally during isometric contractions. Um, a muscle force can be reduced globally because of two causes. One of them is that the activation signal being sent from the nervous system to the muscle can be reduced in its strength, meaning that the active the voluntary activation of the muscle is reduced. And this is often termed central fatigue. I would just refer to this as a reduction in voluntary activation. So either the activation signal received by the muscle can be reduced and or 
the capacity of the muscle to respond to that neural input can be reduced. So there's intrinsic changes within the muscle. That means when the signal arrives at the muscle, it can't respond with the same magnitude of force. And that is termed peripheral fatigue uh, in the literature. I would just refer to that as an impairment in contractile function. Um, So all of these factors can contribute to the sensation of fatigue. Um, But it's important to remember that that's not fatigue itself. It's just a potential contributing factor. Because there's also various other, other perceptual elements that can contribute to the sensation of fatigue, which will and their relative importance will depend on uh, various things like the, the characteristics of exercise or the environmental conditions, for example. So, for example, if you're performing exercise at, um, in, uh, in high temperatures, you'll perceive heat stress. And so if I ask you to rate your fatigue, because the only way we can really measure fatigue is to, to ask people how fatigued they are using questionnaires and scales, that perception of heat stress will be part of that equation which will contribute to your your sensation of fatigue um, or another example could be breathlessness or, di- or the perception of breathlessness that is another factor which if I ask you to rate your fatigue and severe intensity exercise that breathlessness will be sort of part of that equation so you have these neuromuscular elements which certainly can be important in contributing to the sensation of fatigue during exercise. And you also have these other perceptual elements which also contribute to fatigue. And the importance of these factors depends on the, the characteristics of the exercise and, like I said, environment conditions and perhaps the population in question. Mm. So can we go deeper into that uh, when you talk there about uh, asking uh, subjects to rate their fatigue? Um, but we've also talked about um, using iso- a maximum uh, isometric contraction to measure the uh, the, con- the capacity of the, of the muscle to generate force. So can we go a bit deeper into the research methods that are typically used in the fatigue research? How how do you how, how are these studies typically set up, and and also how what are the methods by which you can you can extract these different components and their contribution to the overall fatigue? Yeah, so let's say if we're we're talking about changes in neuromuscular function during exercise. um, So as I said before, these are measured during isometric contractions. So that's when you're, we'll use the knee extensors, the quadriceps as an example, because that is the the most common muscle group studied in relation to endurance exercise, because of course it has, uh, it's a major player in uh, locomotor activities. So we would have participants perform an isometric contraction of the knee extensors where they're pushing against an immovable object. So there's no movement around the joint. Um, and we're measuring the amount of force that they're producing during those isometric contractions. And so we'll ask them to perform a maximal voluntary isometric contraction of the knee extensor. We'll do that, for example, before exercise and after exercise on a, a knee extensor dynamometer so a specialised piece of equipment to measure knee extensor force. Uh, We'll do that before and after exercise. We'll measure the change in the force-generating capacity of the muscle. So that can give us our measures, our measure of fatigability. Um, And as I said before, there's globally those sort of two components which contribute to a reduction in muscle force, i.e. the reduction in voluntary activation and the reduction in contractile function. We can use... um, peripheral nerve stimulation or motor nerve stimulation to assess those two components. So to measure voluntary activation, we have participants perform a maximal voluntary contraction of the knee extensor. When they're at the peak force during that contraction, we will then deliver a a supramaximal electrical stimulation of the femoral nerve. So it's the nerve through which signals are sent to the quadriceps to activate the quadriceps. So if the nervous system, when we're voluntarily performing that contraction, if the nervous system's activation of the muscle is incomplete, so if there's um, motor neurons in the spinal cord which haven't been recruited, or if they're not discharging at uh, an optimal frequency, then when we deliver that stimulation, we will sort of artificially activate those motor neurons which have not been recruited and or increase their discharge rate via the stimulation. And that will then uh, cause an increase in the force produced on top of that already produced voluntarily. 
So we'll have this maximal voluntary contraction, deliver the stimulation, and there will be this superimposed twitch on top of that already produced voluntarily. And the lower the voluntary activation of the muscle, the greater the size of that twitch, the amplitude of that twitch will be. And so we measure the amplitude of that superimposed twitch elicited or evoked by the stimulation. And we put that in equation in an equation and we can measure voluntary activation. So that gives us our measure of voluntary activation. Immediately after the contraction, the participants relax and two or three seconds afterwards will deliver the same supramaximal stimulus at rest. So in this case, there's no voluntary input. We stimulate the nerve, um, the muscle is activated uh, via the stimulation and we'll get what's called a potentiated twitch. So it's a resting twitch response. And if there are uh, impairments occurring within the muscle, then the amplitude of that twitch will be reduced mm. because the signal is only traveling from um, the motor nerve to the muscle. So any reduction in the side of that twitch essentially has to be a result of factors occurring within the muscle. So using these neurostimulation methods, we can uh, assess reduction of force generating capacity, voluntary activation and contractile function. Mm. And and just one uh, slightly uh Slightly detailed, uh, specific follow-up question on that, so the listeners have to bear with me because it's maybe not necessary to understand fatigue. But I'm just curious: do you, if, when you do that measurement in the fresh state, do you still find that you can, with the superimposed twitch during contraction, that you can get an additional uh, superimposed twitch, additional force, so that the nervous system, even when you're fresh, is kind of part of the limit or of, of a limiting factor, or is it always the the muscle that is a limiting factor, if that question makes any yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. That's a good question. Yeah, even in a fresh state, we almost never see a v- voluntary activation of 100%, mm-hmm. i.e. even pre-exercise, um, you can't necessarily, or the vast majority of participants won't be able to recruit their muscle completely. We'll usually find that voluntary activation is, I think it depends on the muscle, but generally can be from around 90 to, you know, 95%. Um, so there can be incomplete activation even uh, prior to exercise. Mm, got it. All right. Uh, so so now let's go, go into some uh, topics where you have uh, discussed the changes in the muscular function that are uh, very interesting and relevant for triathletes. So the first one that I want to get into is the different fatigue mechanisms between cycling and running. So can you discuss the the work you've done there and and your findings? Yeah, sure. So in the last 20 years or so, there's been um, an abundance of research which has assessed the neuromuscular consequences of endurance-type exercise, especially running and cycling. Um, But they had never been uh, directly compared. So there's plenty of studies assessing neuromuscular consequences of running and cycling, but there's never been a comparison between them. Um, But when looking across the literature and making comparisons between studies, um, it seemed evident, or the hypothesis was that running appears to have more of an impact on the nervous system relative to cycling, i.e. reductions in voluntary activation were, were generally greater following running compared with cycling. And conversely, cycling appeared to affect the muscle to a greater extent relative uh, to running. So this was a hypothesis, but it had never been uh, actually been tested. So we designed the study to test that. And to do that, we had, um, I think it was 17 endurance, well-trained endurance athletes who were um, very much familiar with both running and cycling. They performed about five hours of training a week in running and five hours of training a week in cycling. Um, And we had them perform matched intensity and matched duration running and cycling on separate days. Um, So they performed three hours of running on one day and three hours of cycling on another day. Uh, The intensity of exercise was um, just above the gas exchange threshold. So it was 105% of the gas exchange threshold. 
for the listeners that, make- that that yeah. kind of corresponds to the first threshold that we or the first lactate threshold we we often talk about on this podcast but um, yeah different yeah. testing methodology but similar point exactly. on the intensity spectrum yeah exactly so the gas exchange analog of the lactate threshold the first lactate threshold so it was 105 percent of the gas exchange or lactate threshold uh, and we measured neuromuscular function before exercise halfway through the task so at uh, after an hour and a half and post exercise after three hours of exercise. So we measured neuromuscular function using those methods that I've described. So changes in maximal force generating capacity of the muscle, changes in voluntary activation and changes in contractile function to explain those reductions in force generating capacity. And what we found that the magnitude of the reduction in force generating capacity of the knee extensors, which was the muscle group we were interested in, uh, was very similar between the two conditions. So after exercise, muscle force generating capacity was reduced by about 25%. But the sites within the neuromuscular system, which were responsible for that reduction in force, um, were much different between the two the two exercise modalities. Um, so cycling during cycling exercise, there was a much greater impairment in contractile function. So the responses to those resting evoked twitch responses um, were reduced to a much greater extent up to, I think it was up to around five times greater, the reduction in contractile function following cycling compared with running. And actually during running, the quadriceps were relatively unscathed. Um, There wasn't much of a reduction in contractile function following running-based exercise. And then conversely, but despite that being the case, the the force generating capacity of the muscle following running was still very much impaired. And that was because, or appeared to be because, voluntary activation of the muscle was substantially reduced. So there was a much greater impairment in nervous system function and the nervous system's capacity um, to activate the muscle following running relative to cycling. So both running and running and cycling induce impairments in muscle force generating capacity. But the mechanisms by which it does differ between the two modalities. Mm, yeah. And just to make sure that uh, everybody's with us, uh, the contractile function here means basically within the muscle changes. And uh, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what, what do you have a hypothesis for why uh, the mechanisms behind uh, the fatigue were different? Yeah. So... If we think about cycling, um, I mean, overall, I think it relates to um, the relative contribution of the quadriceps to um, force or power production during exercise, uh, as well as the, the the level of active muscle mass and the contraction types. Um, so if we start with the, the active muscle mass and the contribution of the quadriceps. So during cycling, um, cycling is obviously a weight-supported sport. And there's, um, I guess, a much greater involvement of the quadriceps during cycling compared with running, which is more whole body, where you know the ankle extensors become much more important, of course, during running compared with cycling. So there's a more focal stress on the quadriceps um, during cycling compared with running. So anyone who's cycled before, you, you, you can feel that discomfort coming from the quadriceps, which you don't necessarily feel to the same extent during running. So that's because the activation of the quadriceps is greater, and so the metabolic demand within the quadriceps is greater, and so the metabolic stress and the rate of fuel utilization, for example, within the quadriceps is likely to be much greater during cycling compared with running. Um, And as a result of that greater metabolic stress and that greater fuel utilization, um, that is likely to increase the concentration of um, metabolites, which impair contractile, contractile function, so they cause um, uh, impairments occurring within the muscle itself. Another factor is the contraction type. So during cycling, this is repeated concentric contractions of the quadriceps, which occur throughout a large proportion of that pedal rotation. So the quadriceps are activated for quite a long time and the contractions are concentric in nature during that pedal rotation. Um, whereas during running, um, that running is associated with repeated stretch shortening cycle. 
um, where the muscle during this sort of stance phase, the muscle is elongated whilst under tension before when we propel forward, we have those concentric contractions. So it's eccentric, um, precedes proceed, the concentric contraction, and that's known as a stretch shortening cycle. And that's a more efficient contraction type. Um, so during cycling, the contraction type is less efficient, which again can would lead to an increase in the, the metabolic demand and the, the metabolic stress relative to running. Um, so these are some of the reasons why it was definitely expected that the impairments occurring within the muscle would be greater in response to, to cycling rather than running. Um, then conversely, in terms of the impairments in nervous system function after running, th- this becomes more speculative. We, we can't say for sure exactly why this occurred. I mean, our thinking, and if you look at review papers prior to this study, which had kind of recognized that running can do a number on the nervous system and and, uh, reduce voluntary activation quite substantially. Muscle damage was generally the the proposed cause of that. It's probably the most often proposed cause, but I don't think our results actually suggest that that's the case because the changes in evoked resting twitch responses were minimal. So if there was... Um, muscle damage, then we would expect that they would be reduced, which wasn't really the case. They were reduced to a very small extent, suggesting that three hours of running on a treadmill didn't cause much damage in the quadriceps, at least that we could measure. Um, So nervous system function appeared to be impaired despite there being essentially or very little muscle damage from the quadriceps at least. So it's something else that is contributing to that reduction in voluntary activation. Um, Exactly what that is is speculative. We did use other measurement um, techniques. So, for example, we stimulated uh, the spinal cord. So we put put electrodes um, at the thoracic level of the spinal cord. We deliver an electrical stimulation that activates neurons which descend onto alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. So these are the neurons through which all um, signals to activate the muscle are sent. All signals have to pass through these motor neurons. And with using that method, um, we found that the capacity of motor neurons to respond to that stimulation stimulation was really substantially reduced following running. So there appeared to be some impairment in motor neuron responsiveness. And this may have been an important contributor to that reduction in voluntary activation that we saw in that uh, impairment in nervous system function. Mm, Yeah, just going back to one point you made there uh, to clarify for the listeners when we talk about concentric and eccentric contractions, that, that simply means whether... Uh, the contraction is by the muscles shortening or or lengthening action so that's clear for everybody Uh, but yeah that's that's really interesting uh interesting to hear and uh and i guess that also leaves some room for future research to figure out the exact mechanisms especially for the central uh fatigue in running what if any uh practical applications do you see these results having and and perhaps in particular is there anything for triathletes that have to run after they bike in a racing situation um yeah i think that you know the study was kind of mechanistic in nature but you know it's always interesting to think about potential practical implications i think one thing that i thought and one thing i was interested by was that running caused very little change uh, within the muscle itself. So there was very little impairment or perturbation going on within the quadriceps, um, whereas that wasn't the case after cycling. I suppose that from a training perspective, um, the fact that there was very little perturbation going on within the quadriceps in response to running perhaps has some implications in terms of the crossover of those two training modalities And I'm sure all triathletes are obviously training, running and cycling anyways. But the fact is that those impairments that occur in contractile function are the same mechanisms that lead to impairment in contractile function at the muscle level are likely the same mechanisms which promote adaptations within the muscle. 
And so the fact that in response to three hours of running, there was very little perturbation within the quadriceps probably means the, the adaptive stimulus is also quite low. So if, for example, and I'm sure this would never be the case, you're a triathlete and you're not doing much cycling and you're doing a lot of running, then you might not be getting those peripheral adaptations within the quadriceps, which are clearly important in response to cycling. Mm. So I think from a practical perspective, it highlights the the importance of um, training in both modalities to ensure you're getting those appropriate adaptations for those specific modalities. Yeah, specificity for sure. Um, Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Another study that you uh, conducted, which was equally interesting, I think, was uh, about how intensity domains impacted Mm -hmm. fatigability. So you compared uh, intensities in the moderate versus in the heavy domain in cycling. Uh, So can you discuss that study? Uh, What did you do and what did you find? Yeah, so it it's it's well established that the boundary between heavy and severe intensity exercise, um, which is often measured using critical power, um, it's it's well known, it's well established that that threshold has very important implications for neuromuscular fatigability. So when we exceed the threshold between heavy and severe intensity exercise, um aerobic metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation is no longer sufficient to meet the the energy demands of the task. So we have to draw upon anaerobic energy resources, um, which are associated with the production of metabolites, which impair contractile function. And also we're progressively less efficient during severe intensity exercise. So the energy cost of the task is not stable. And so there's an increase in flux through all metabolic pathways. There's a continuous increase in metabolites, which impair contractile function. And so we are progressively, um, our neuromuscular function is progressively impaired. So that was well established. But the importance of the boundary between moderate and heavy intensity exercise, or whether there were any neuromuscular implications for exceeding that boundary during exercise, um, wasn't well understood or wasn't that that question had never been addressed and that could have implications for for example in clinical populations who whose lactate or gas exchange threshold is often very low in patients with chronic disease um, so they probably exceed that boundary even during activity to daily living um, but also for endurance athletes especially for during much more prolonged endurance events which might be performed sort of on the cusp between moderate and heavy intensity exercise. So we designed the study to address that question. And the way we did that is we had um, three constant work rate or constant power output trials performed on separate days. One was at 70% of the gas exchange threshold. And then 20% above that, we had 90% of the gas exchange threshold. 20% above that, we had 110% of the gas exchange threshold. So we had one heavy intensity bout and two moderate intensity bouts. They were matched for external work. So the uh, 110% gas exchange threshold trial was 90 minutes. Uh, At 90% of the gas exchange threshold was 110 minutes. And at 70% of the gas exchange threshold, we were, it was 140 minutes. And we assessed neuromuscular function at various um, percentages of task completion. So the tasks weren't performed to task failure, but we assessed neuromuscular function after 25, 50, 75, and 100% of the task. And then we compared the changes in neuromuscular function during those three three bouts of exercise. Um, So if exceeding... So those three uh, work rates were equidistant. So there was 20% difference between those three work rates, 70% to 90%, and then we cross the boundary between moderate and heavy intensity exercise and we go to 110% of gas exchange threshold. So if fatigability is uh, disproportionately higher above the gas exchange threshold, then we would expect any difference between 90 and 110% of the gas exchange threshold to be greater than the difference between 70 and 90%. I hope that makes sense. Yep. Uh, And that's exactly what we found. So during all three uh, 
bouts of exercise, neuromuscular function was impaired. So there was reductions in maximal force generating capacity. They occurred quite early during the task. So when we measured at 25% of task completion during all uh, bouts, whether moderate or heavy, there were impairments in neuromuscular function but they were much greater following heavy versus moderate intensity exercise. So for a given amount of external work completed, the reduction in uh, muscle force generating capacity was up to uh, 2.6 times greater during heavy versus moderate intensity exercise. And using those uh, using the motor nerve stimulation methods that I, I spoke about earlier, we identified that that was because that was due to factors residing within the muscle, mechanisms occurring within the muscle were responsible for that greater fatigability during heavy versus moderate intensity exercise. Mm, yeah, no, that's that's extremely interesting. And and again, uh, just uh, highlighting that point that these conditions were matched for external work. So they they basically exercised the exact same amount of, of kilojoules. And, uh, and that's why the times were shorter in, at the higher intensity. So yeah, in, in theory, you could also assume that, uh, well, of course, that's not what, what you had as your hypothesis, but but just based on energy, you could say that, well, you should be equally tired after the same amount of kilojoules, but that's not what yeah. you saw. So, so that's really interesting, uh, both for um, your clinical populations, but also, as you said, for longer races where you are uh, often racing right at that cusp or even in Ironman racing, most amateur athletes will clearly be in that uh, in that moderate intensity domain rather than uh, heavy domain. But in half Ironman, they might be in the heavy domain. So, so then that could have implications for the type of fatigue that you will encounter in in those two different types of races. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, again, same question here. Do you see any uh, practical applications uh, or potential practical applications of these results? Yeah, I think that from a training perspective, um, it's quite cliche where they say, um, make your easy days easy. Uh, and the fact that if you cross that boundary between moderate and heavy intensity exercise, um, the energy cost of exercise is disproportionately higher during heavy intensity exercise. And neuromuscular function is disproportionately impaired. And so there are Although we didn't measure recovery, there is likely to be a greater recovery cost following heavy versus moderate intensity exercise. So I think it, and and that occurs very early during the task. So we showed that those changes manifested very um, soon following um, commencing heavy intensity exercise. So I think it highlights the importance of um, if you can know where those thresholds are. And when you want to perform an easy training session with a limited recovery cost, um, then try and ensure that you're you're staying below that that uh, boundary between moderate and heavy intensity exercise to then, in turn, um, reduce the uh, the impairments in neuromuscular function that uh, that we saw. Yeah, no, I think that's spot on, and and also one. Um a bit of a cliche i guess is to err on the side of caution so because what you saw there very clearly is that let's say that you're you're aiming to exercise at 90 percent of your gas exchange threshold like you had the middle group do but but if you don't quite know or your your threshold might not be set quite correctly you're not exactly sure where it is and then you just accidentally end up performing it at slightly above then that's a very different exercise than if you just perform it slightly below instead then you still get the same kind of um, uh, neuromuscular cost and fatigue cost probably and but probably also as you said before similar adaptations uh, because the the signals in the muscles and centrally are are similar between those two so it's better to 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 aim lower rather than higher yeah exactly yeah no, that, that makes sense so uh, then if we uh, tackle some general questions about neuromuscular fatigue this you have written about this as well you have a great review on on this entire field that i will link to in the show notes as well um we discussed here already the the heavy and and moderate domains but can you just repeat the severe and extreme domains and how they might compare to to the fatigue uh, types of fatigue we see in in the heavy and moderate domains yeah, so if I if I go back to the 
the boundary between or the maximum metabolic steady state when we go between heavy and severe intensity exercise. So below that threshold, which is usually often measured with critical power, um, oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic metabolism is sufficient to meet the energy demands of the task. So aerobic metabolism is producing ATP at a sufficient rate to meet the ATP demands of the the power being produced. Um, but when we cross that boundary, that's no longer um, that's no longer the case. So oxidative phosphorylation isn't sufficient to meet those ATP demands. We have to draw upon anaerobic uh, energy resources. So phosphorylating concentration continues to decrease. There's an in- increase in inorganic phosphate when that happens. Inorganic phosphate has potent uh, inhibitory effects on contractile function. So through a number of mechanisms, it reduces the, mus- the capacity of our muscle uh, to respond to the signals being sent by the nervous system. And because the energy demand of the task is not stable, the energy dem- even if we stay at the same power output, the energy demand of the task will keep increasing. Um, the, the, re- the metabolic requirement also keeps increasing. So the flux through all the metabolic pathways keeps increasing. And so there's a VO2 slow component because oxidative phosphorylation needs to keep increasing. Um, and there's also a met- uh, slow, component, slow component in terms of metabolite concentrations in the muscle. And because they have such potent effects on contractile function, neuromuscular function will be um, rapidly impaired during severe intensity exercise and disproportionately so relative um, to heavy intensity exercise. Uh, Extreme intensity exercise, I think that I don't know that there are differences in the neuromuscular mechanisms between severe and extreme intensity exercise other than it's, it's probably the same mechanisms but just occurring at a much greater rate during um, during extreme versus severe intensity exercise. And just to clarify, in the severe and extreme intensity domain, you're mostly seeing that the the peripheral, uh, the contractile function is is the component that is most rate limiting and, and causing the biggest part of the um, of the decrease in neuromuscular function. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So you you can definitely see a reduction of voluntary activation in in response to um, severe intensity exercise. The nervous system is impacted, and that's probably. I mean, we often sort of dichotomize these two things, you know, central and peripheral fatigue. Um, they can certainly they're, they're not mutually exclusive. They can certainly be related. Uh, and during severe intensity exercise, as I said, there's that build up of metabolites within the muscle, and there's all these changes and going on within the muscle. Uh, and there are receptors within the muscle which are sensitive to those metabolic changes. So there's these free nerve endings which are sensitive to metabolic perturbations and they're basically activated by the increase in metabolites within the muscle. And as a result, they send signals to the nervous system via what are known as group 3, 4 afferents. And within the nervous system, so at the level of the spinal cord and the brain, they can have inhibitory effects on the nervous system. So these these changes going on within the muscle, um, it's not just the muscle, you know, that they are fed back to the nervous system. There they can have inhibitory effects. Um, but certainly the nervous system function in general is uh, the, the impairment in nervous system function and involuntary activation. Um, increases with exercise duration so Mm. certainly in response to extreme intensity exercise we would expect much less of an impairment in nervous system function yeah and and just finalizing that point so uh, of course the fatigue is going to be the greatest with higher intensity uh relative to for the same duration at least um but but is it and, and then as you go down the intensity domains, is it fair to say that even though you might always have both components, the contractile function and voluntary activation, but in the lower the lower you go in intensity domains, the more voluntary activation becomes relatively speaking the more prominent, let's say. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. Um, yeah, as you say, it's all some sort of combination. I think if you were, if you perform you know, heavy, let's say heavy intensity exercise to task failure, which obviously takes m- much longer. 
when you reach that task failure, yeah. So at, in theory, when you reach task failure, you're you're producing as much force and as power as possible. So at that point, you're you're performing maxly. I know there's all sorts sorts of debate on that, but in theory, so. Yeah, uh, an important contributor to that would be your reduction in voluntary activation, the nervous system um, component. But certainly, um, impairments in contractile function still contribute, especially because of things like glycogen depletion, which we know can um, can impair contractile function. So it is a combination, but yeah, I would say you're right. Relatively speaking, the nervous system becomes much more important. Mm. And uh, so this, you already alluded to this just uh, just now, but what is the impact of duration on the fatigue mechanisms? Of exercise duration yeah. on fatigue? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, it's... Um, the, the longer we perform exercise, it appears the, the more the nervous system is impacted. Um, so increasing exercise duration in terms of mechanisms of neuromuscular fatigability, uh, they become more central in origin. Mm, yeah. Uh, and what do we know, if anything, about the recovery time course of neuromuscular function? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think it depends a lot on the exercise modality. Um, I think certainly after running, um, neuromuscular function, um, the, uh, it takes much longer to recover neuromuscular function following running relative to cycling. And that is probably relates to muscle damage, although we didn't observe any evidence of muscle damage from the quadriceps certainly in other muscle groups that would be expected and it's also important to remember for the study that we did that that was performed on a, on a treadmill um it's much different especially if you're in uneven terrain and there's lots of downhills um where there are eccentric muscle contractions um which can evoke and induce muscle damage and, and delay the time course of recovery i think it de- depends a lot on like i said the terrain the duration and intensity of that bout in terms of being able to say precisely it's going to take you this long to recover following exercise. Do, uh, so do we have any on, do we have any information on relatively speaking recovery of the the central nervous system or recovery of voluntary activation versus contractile function? I guess that might also mm-hmm. depend on what sort of contractile function we're talking about. For example, glycogen depletion might be very different compared to uh, from from let's say heavy intensity exercise versus uh, metabolite buildup from severe intensity exercise might be completely different stories. Yeah, so it very much depends on intensity and modality of exercise. Uh, so I actually did my PhD looking at recovery of nervous system function. That was following intermittent sprint exercise, so it was football match play, uh, and so it's a bit different from endurance exercise, but it's certainly a. a, a um, there's certainly a high degree of muscle damage induced by um, high intensity intermittent team sports like football. Uh, And we found that um, nervous system function is impaired uh, for a prolonged period following football match play. Um, So even 24 hours following a football match, uh, the nervous system's capacity to activate the muscle is still reduced um, modestly, but significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, And it takes up to two days um, to be restored to pre-exercise levels. So nervous system function can be um, can be reduced for prolonged periods. Uh, I think that that is related to the muscle damage induced. So the more damaging your bout of exercise, the greater effect on the nervous system in general. And then in terms of contractile function, like you said, it depends a lot on the intensity of exercise. If we perform severe intensity exercise where there's a high degree of metabolite buildup, and then we stop exercise, those things will be restored. The the concentration of metabolites in the muscle will be restored relatively rapidly. And the majority of recovery um, occurs very quickly. We may not be – there may – so there's kind of a fast and a slow component of that recovery, if that makes sense. Um, And in terms of more prolonged glycogen depletion exercise – um, this will obviously the, the recovery of that will depend on our sort of feeding strategies and our nutritional strategies strategies post exercise. But I would say that if there are appropriate nutritional strategies, then we can increase glycogen above the levels which are thought to impair contractile function uh, 
relatively rapidly within the first few hours after exercise. doesn't mean glycogen will be completely restored, but it will be above those levels that, that we can take from the literature which where contractile function is impaired. Mm, yeah, no, that's all really interesting. And especially I think the, uh, the nervous system recovery that you talked about and uh, your PhD, uh, super, super fascinating. And uh, then what can we know? What do we know about things like other modulating factors such as carbohydrate intake during exercise and environmental conditions maybe if there's anything else that you can think of uh do yeah are these things that that we know uh know about how they how they might impact uh the fatigue and neuromuscular fatigue that we get from exercise yeah so so in terms of environmental conditions hypoxia is one that's a, in which there's been a lot of research and um there's definitely plenty of evidence that going into hypoxic conditions um, reduces voluntary activation. So there's, uh, there's, there appears to be a big effect on the nervous system when we perform exercise at high altitudes and, uh, and uh, under uh, low oxygen pressures. Uh, and what that does, it reduces activation of the muscle. Um, and by doing so, it sort of preserves contractile function in a way. So if we perform exercise at hypoxia, we see more substantial reductions in voluntary activation relative to normoxia. And we see less, probably as a result of that, uh, we see less of an impairment in contractile function. Um, so certainly the environmental conditions can be important. In terms of carbohydrate um, feeding, you know, during exercise or post-exercise, I don't th- think, I don't know of any evidence in terms of neuromuscular function um, that there is any effect and and that has been specifically looked at. I remember there was a a study from Arthur Cheng um, who does a lot of research on peripheral mechanisms of of fatigability and uh, they they did an exercise trial which was specifically designed to deplete muscle glycogen and they took biopsies and showed that that was the case and they either gave people... um, uh, they, they either had participants ingest carbohydrates or a placebo, and then they measured the recovery of contractile function. And there wasn't actually any effect um, on contractile function, despite the glycogen levels having been greater following um, uh, carbohydrate ingestion. So I think there isn't currently evidence that it will impact um, neuromuscular function, but I'm definitely not saying that that means that you know there can be effects in other areas, and it's definitely carbohydrate ingestion is definitely can definitely be important during exercise, especially when it's more prolonged. It's just that there isn't any evidence that I know of um, that there's much of an effect on on uh, neuromuscular function. Yeah, yeah. No, we always have to be careful with um, extrapolating findings from one very specific area to others. And yeah, well, exactly. that's actually ne- next week's episode with Dr. Tim Podlegar about carbohydrates in in exercise. So. Uh, mm-hmm. So more to come on that uh, on that topic. Um, then the only other question that I have to ask on on this topic is: What research are you working on, or maybe planning to do uh, next? And uh, also, what future re- research in general, not just from yourself, but do you think is uh, would be great to see in uh, this uh, on this topic of fatigue mechanisms? <sighs> Yeah, so I think that, um, as I said before, I, I, I'm interested in fatigability, but from a more from from an integrative perspective. So, if a lot of um, physiology physiology research is quite sort of reductionist, so we can focus on the neuromuscular system or the cardiovascular system or the respiratory system. Um, I, for me, my sort of aims with my research in this area going forward is to have a more holistic, integrative understanding. Um, of what is limiting the neuromuscular system um, systemically rather than just, you know, central or peripheral uh, in both clinical and athletic populations. And I think in general that this is a an area where we can kind of move forward and improve on it is, is understanding better how systems interact. Uh, another area that I'm interested in... Was, so, um, sorry, can, I if I can interject there on that. So, yeah. so can you... Um, can you explain that a little bit further, or what, what, do you have like a hypothesis for what what might be uh, 
yeah what, what what might be happening or, or anything like that because yeah i'm just not quite yeah. quite clear of what exactly it is you're saying with okay, okay so 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 um as i was i think i briefly mentioned at the start of uh the podcast is you know one of the reasons that i'm interested in um the field of neuromuscular fatigability or that area of research is that the impairments in neuromuscular function that we see during exercise are in a sense the manifestation of everything occurring within and upstream of the muscle. So they're almost the final output of everything that's occurring upstream. So they can be influenced by um, factors residing within the muscle. So for example, muscle oxidative capacity and the, the metabolic perturbations occurring within the muscle, which in turn are influenced by the cardiovascular system's ability to transport oxygen to the muscle to be used for oxidative phosphorylation. And in turn, those can, those the, the ability to transport oxygen to the muscle can be influenced by pulmonary function, so the ability of oxygen to get from the lungs into pulmonary circulation, um, the capacity of the blood to pump blood around the body to the muscle, the capacity of the um, or the the appropriate distribution of blood to the muscle where it's required, uh, the the capacity of that oxygen to diffuse from the capillaries to the muscle, and all of these. So I don't have a specific hypothesis because I'm not sort of talking about a specific question. But what I'm interested in is how these systemic integrative factors limit the neuromuscular system in different populations. So, for example, in populations with chronic disease, in different environmental conditions like, uh, like I said, hypoxia or high temperatures, um, and in response to exor- or different characteristics of exercise. So these various factors may be more influential in response to certain intensities of exercise or perhaps certain modalities and certain durations. So it's understanding these things more globally is sort of where I would like to go with future research. Um, so there's no specific hypothesis mm. here. No, but I, I got you. Got, uh, yeah, I understand that, that now. Yeah, that's... And, and if, I, if I could just add as well, I know that one area which is um, kind of getting a lot of traction in endurance exercise is uh, what's being termed durability. So changes in the some of the physiological determinants of endurance performance, like, for example, critical power. I would certainly like to do work and I'm planning to do work to um, to assess the neuromuscular contributions to that. So is the neuromuscular system implicated in those um, reductions in critical power that uh, a few studies now have, have demonstrated? So that's another area of research I would mm. like to uh, yeah. pursue. Yeah, no, um Ed Maunder, Dr. Ed Maunder and Steven Seiler uh, were on for a joint uh, episode uh, talking about durability. So I'll link to that in, in the show notes. Uh, now let's move on to the rapid fire questions. So take just one sentence to answer these. And the first one is, what's your favorite book or resource related to endurance sports? Um, it's a book called Muscle and Exercise Physiology, edited by uh, Jersey Zolads. And what's an important habit that you've benefited from athletically, professionally or personally? Uh, perseverance and who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you uh, i will say my two former supervisors professor guillaume mier and uh, dr kevin thomas fantastic and uh finally uh, where can people find you online and find find your work uh, and is there anything else you want to mention feel free to do so uh yeah they, so they can find me on twitter my handle is at c g brownstein and then uh, on my twitter page there's a link to my uh, research gate where they can find uh, all of my research great uh thank you so much callum it's been great to chat to you and uh, definitely looking forward to a, a follow-up at some point in the future uh on some some of your future research yeah no no happy to do it anytime just, just let me know I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com where we'll link to Callum's Twitter and research gate and the studies that we mentioned that are relevant for this episode. Also, a couple of uh, previous podcast episodes that we mentioned either directly or in passing or that are otherwise relevant to this discussion uh, were uh, the episodes with Ed Maunder and Steven Seiler on durability, uh, the episode with uh, Tim Podlegar on carbohydrates and also 
an episode I did with Mark Burnley where one of the topics discussed was fatigue and complexity. Uh, also, uh, Callum's uh, recommended book will be in the links in the episode description and show notes. Next Monday, I interview UK-based cycling coach Tom Bell, who some of you might be familiar with from the excellent articles that he writes on behalf of his coaching business, High North, so stay tuned for that. And if you want to improve your triathlon performance and want help to achieve your goals, then consider working with a scientific triathlon coach or a training plan. Whether you are just getting into triathlon, trying to qualify for a world championship event, or even want to race professionally, we have experience in all of those scenarios and would love to discuss further around if and how we can help you on your triathlon journey. Find out more and contact us on scientifictriathlon.com and we can discuss your goals and needs and see what's best for you. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swimskins, goggles, and exceptional sunglasses and prescription glasses for every day from day to day wear to extreme action sports. Use the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS to get 20% off your entire Roka order. And thank you to Zen8. Use the Zen8 swim trainer to improve your technique, power, stamina, and most importantly, your swim training consistency. Get 20% off your order on the swim trainer with the promo code that you can get on zen8swimtrainer.com forward slash tts and don't forget that it's a risk-free investment if you don't love it after two weeks send it back and you'll get a full refund thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving crap